Yeah, most of them. Most of them. Yeah, most most places. You know, once sort of follow the lead. So the search the, is on the advanced search of Google. It's also on Flickr. If you look around, it probably is one there, too. So I could pick one of these if I thought it was acceptable for my purpose. Again, it's 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 a mixed bag, right? You know, you're getting this for free, so this you know it's it, it's not necessarily anyone that is a great photographer. Um, it, it can be just literally anyone posts the, the stuff up there. But it is available, and again, you know, you can find the diamond in the rough. So I guess my point with this is that don't think that the only way you can get images is run out and take them yourself. All right? Now, to be sure, you can't download and use anything from the Internet because if it's protected by a standard copyright, it's illegal to do that. But if you purchase a license through stock photography or if you uh, do a search for Creative Commons, then you can, you can pull things off the Internet. Uh, the last thing would be to hire a professional. Yeah. If you didn't use it for anything other than uh, classroom work, would it still be illegal? No. You, you have a lot more flexibility if you're using it for a classroom work. Uh, I, I actually have a handout of that online. Uh, in essence, um, the laws in an educational context is just don't take too much and make sure you give credit. And giving credit you know, is always a good idea you know, you, with Creative Commons as well. Um, not so much with Flickr, but like with the Google search, uh -huh. um, is there a possibility that you'd run into where somebody took a picture from somewhere else and then put it up there and licensed it as free? <laughs> Uh, is there a, uh, you know what, if anyone ever asks me a question that starts with, is it possible that, I'm going to answer yeah. Okay. All right, because yeah, is it, it certainly is, yeah, pardon me? Is it reasonable? It, is it, it's probably even reasonable to, to, to think that. Um, about the only thing I would say is if you could document that, that, you know, and, and with, with uh, you know, the URL where you got it from and all that, then you would be pretty safe. Um, from any kind of recourse, I would think. Hey, it's, you know, I'm not going to, I didn't, you know, this person posted it as their own, all right? They're the one that violated copyright. They tricked me, essentially, into saying that they were authorized to license it as a Creative Commons uh, work, and, and so. So you use a proxy server overseas to create a, a bogus account overseas, and, <laughs> and then blame it on the guy overseas. No, no. <laughs> there's enough Creative Commons work that's legitimately licensed that so you probably don't need to do that. Uh, Creative Commons, by the way, is, uh, again, one of those things that works for all multimedia uh, elements. So in other words, there are, uh, there's Creative Commons music, there's Creative Commons video. You know, my lectures are licensed for Creative Commons. If you, anyone wants to go and, you know, remix one of my... Uh, uh, lectures on, on YouTube, you're free to do that. So it works in, in all those different contexts as well. So, you know, I introduce it because this is the first time it really makes sense to introduce it, but when we talk about audio, that might be a good one, right? You know, because everyone has digital cameras. You can probably take pictures of what you want, but not everyone's a composer. So if you want a little snippet of audio to go with something, well, that's a little harder for people to do. So Creative Commons becomes a good source there. All right, let's look in the actual editing of images. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to play around uh, with some images using the GIMP just to introduce some, some concepts. Yes? Just real quick. What, would, what about uh, like corporate logos? Like if you were doing something on Microsoft, do you have to try and find something that's licensed as that? Or typically, typically what I've seen is there's policies concerning the use of logos like that. For example, I did a, uh, when we first started, uh, let's see, when did we do this? I did a, a, a little uh, marketing poster for our Java class, and I wanted to talk about how Java is used in programming Android. So I wanted a little Android guy, you know, the little Android robot. Well, when I went on and, and did searches for that, it specified the terms under which I was allowed to use it. You know, I couldn't, like, edit it and, and, and give it a mustache or, I, you know, I couldn't do goofy things to it, 
but it, it specified the terms under which I could use it. And my guess would be a lot of organizations have that, especially organizations where you might want to uh, express an affiliation. For example, if you are a Microsoft, uh, you know, you have Microsoft certification, you might want to put the Microsoft logo. Well, they know that people that are Microsoft certified want to do that, so they probably have already described the terms under which you could use it. So again, I know that's the case in, 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 like I said, with the Android example, and I would speculate that would be the case in many others as well. Ooh, good question. I do have to confess, though, I'm not a lawyer, so, you know, this is not meant to be taken as, as legal advice. All right. What I'm going to do now is I'm just going to take uh, just one of our dumb sample images, and I'm going to play around editing it, and I'm going to do it using the GIMP. The GIMP is, again, open source software. This is really our first opportunity to talk about open source software. In essence, the idea of open source software is that when programs are written, there's, there's the source code, which is the code that the programmers use to create it, then there's the object code, which is actually installed and executed and run on the machine. So typically, if you were to buy Microsoft Office, for example, and install it here, you'd be installing the object code. You would not be installing the source code. Now, for some companies, the source code is a valued asset, right? You know, Microsoft makes millions off of their Office suite, right? And therefore, they protect it. You know, it's considered trade secrets and all that kind of stuff. So that's why you kind of have to pay for it. They spend a lot of money for it, and the only way you can get it is through them. Um, with open source, though, there's a different philosophy that's used. And the philosophy is sort of like, we're going to make our source code available to any developer in the world. And that way, people can add things to our application, and it's just going to make for a stronger application. If there's problems with it, there's going to be hundreds of people looking at those problems and trying to figure out how to fix them. It's one of those things that sounds like it shouldn't work, all right? But it actually does, all right? Linux is an example of an open source platform, extremely solid operating system. The Apache web server is an example of open source software. The GIMP is an example of open source software, which is a powerful image editing tool uh, that's absolutely free. Not only is it free, if you were so inclined, you could actually download the source code and create enhancements for it and have it accepted as part of it. Android. Pardon me? Android is open source. Yeah, Android is open source as well. And legally resell it. There are conditions about how you can do that. Usually people make money with open source stuff in a variety of different ways, because that's sort of the logical question. It's like, well, how do you make like, money off like it? Like Audacity. You could download the source card, source card, source code, put your name on it, and resell it. Could you do that? I don't know. Yeah, like free software. Um, Earlier versions were sold as other things, license free. Yeah, um, I, I would have to read. I would have to read the license when when you download it. Um, typically, what organizations do, for example, uh, with Linux, you know, is open source. Anyone could go and download it and install it, but. Someone creates nice little install disks with a little manual and help and provides support. So they, they sort of have a value added thing to it. Um, and that's typically how file folks uh, make their money. If you were selling Audacity, I don't know why anyone would buy it if they could download it for free. You know, so e even if that was legal, it probably wouldn't be a good idea. Real, or, Real Networks gave me, gave me a copy of an early version of Audacity when I bought a, a sound card. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't called Audacity or SoundForge, it was called something else. Okay. Let's talk about why we would want to change images. We want to change images for any number of reasons. <coughs> we might want to change the format of the image. All right. We might, we might, for example, have a JPEG that we want to make into a PNG. Why would we want to make it into a PNG? Well, maybe we need to add transparency to it somehow, and we can't do that as a JPEG. Or maybe someone scanned and gave us a logo, a company logo, as a JPEG file, and we know we can make it smaller if we convert it to a GIF. So one reason we'd want to uh, uh, edit an image would be to um, 
would be to convert the file format. So that's one form of editing. Second form of editing would be to resize the image. In other words, this image is big jellyfish. Maybe we don't need a big jellyfish. Maybe we need a small jellyfish. If you're going to only use a small jellyfish, why require the bandwidth for a big jellyfish? So therefore, we're going to go and, and make a smaller version. So that's the second one. Another reason we want to do it is to alter the image in some way, such as cropping the image. Maybe we don't want to show, for example, all the blue sea around it, but we want to get rid of and only show the jellyfish. That's known as cropping the image. In other words, you know, if you had a picture, let's say, of 20 people you know, in, a, in a class photograph, maybe you only want to crop out your face from it and, and show that uh, on there. So that's what's known as cropping. There's any number of different fixes you can do. Now, in this case, this is a, a good photograph, so we don't really have that there. But, for example, a picture could be too bright, or it could be too dark, or it could be washed out. You know, if someone's in very bright sunlight, you kind of like lose the shadows and everything sort of blends together, you know. So you can make it darker, you can make it brighter, you can change the um, uh, contrast. Lastly, we might want to change the saturation. And the saturation essentially is how vivid the colors are. For example, no saturation would be a black and white image. So maybe we want this jellyfish, but we want it in, um, in, uh, you know, in black and white. Or maybe we just want to tone down the color a little bit. All right? maybe, that, maybe we think that pops too much and we want to tone it down a little bit. Then I would get into the realm of sort of artistic photo manipulation. In other words, we want to take this jellyfish and put SpongeBob swimming frantically behind them, or make composite photos, or somehow artfully edit this for whatever kind of effect that we have. All right, all these things affect the image, and we can you can do things to create mood. You know. You can, with higher contrast, you can make a person look a lot seriouser, all right, in black and white. Have you ever notice in the, in the political campaigns, when they show the person that is running, that the, that the ad is for, they show a color picture. When they show the opponent, they typically show a dreary looking black and white picture. You can almost tell, based on the choice of, of pictures they show, who it is they're supporting. Even if you didn't hear the sound or see the words, you can almost tell who they're supporting just based on that. Um, saturation. Um, uh, anyone see the French movie Amelie? It's a very saturized, the colors were very saturized, that is, they're very vivid, which created a mood. Or the TV show recent years, uh, Pushing Daisies, did the same thing. Very saturated colors. If you change the colors a bit, you can make things look a little dull, a little duller. You can make colors warmer, that is more reddish and oranges, or you can make it more cold or cooler, which is more bluish. And you can do that to create moods. Um, there was a, a movie called uh, Little Buddha, which is about these Buddhist monks and, and so on and so forth. Part of it took place in Seattle, part of it took place in Nepal. And the scenes that they shot in Seattle, all the colors were cool. I mean, they, 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 you could tell it was very much shifted to the blue end of the color spectrum. All right, When they were in Nepal, it was bumped the other way to give a much warmer color. And they did that to create the emotional effect that they were trying to create. So you can, you can how do I want to say this? Part of the thing is to fix pictures. In other words, pictures that don't show up exactly right. Um, there's something called white balance. Like, for example, our eyes are, are wonderful in the fact that they adjust for the different kinds of light. You know, things look different in different color light. You know, if you take a picture of someone, let's say, under artificial light, and take a picture of them under sunlight, they're going to look different, right? And a white sheet of paper. If I took a picture of a white sheet of paper under artificial light and then took a picture of it under natural light, you'd be surprised how different it is. Your eyes automatically make those adjustments. The camera doesn't, all right? And therefore, you can... You can change it to look more natural, or you can intentionally skew it to give some sort of emotional effect. So there's both sort of the expressive way for doing it, 
then there's a way to sort of fix the image and look at more look at look like it more more normal. Let's just go around and play with some of the things in the GIMP for this particular image, and we'll run through it. So let me open this image in the GIMP, which does take a while to open the first time through. Really? There we go. Why did it take like three hours last time? already in RAM because you had it open earlier. Did I have it open earlier? Okay, I did not recall opening it earlier. Wow. All right, so if I wanted to save this as another kind of image, if I wanted to save this as a PNG, how do you do that? It's pretty easy. File, Save As, and then you can either select the file type or simply change the extension here. So I'll type in PNG, that will save this. as a PNG file. There are some options I can take. I can go and save it. All right. Let's say I go and try to save this as a JPEG file now that I changed it to a PNG. All right. Notice how I have an option of the quality. What does the quality mean? Well, the high, closer to 100% it's going to do, it's going to make for a bigger file, but it's going to compress it less, and therefore it's going to lose less information. So again, higher quality, more loss information. So if I save it as 100%, if I go in and save it as make it really bad. Let's look at the difference in the file size. That's the PNG version. Jellyfish JPEG is roughly a meg, 900 kilobytes. The bad quality is only 18 KB. Let's look at, is it a perceptible difference? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me turn off the lights for a second. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a low quality uh, image. So, what did they do? Well, let's look at the original. Yeah, right, right. Let's look at the original. What they did effectively is because we said we wanted this one to be more compressed, it approximated some colors. Actually, as we move from here to here, it's a different blue. But since we specify such a high level of compression, low quality, it said, you know, there's really not that much difference between this blue and this blue, so I'm going to make it the same. So therefore, we get these bands of blue instead of a continuous line. That's what I mean by losing quality. We've lost some information because we've gone overboard with compressing it. Which means that if I edited this guy and tried to save it more, I'd lose even more. Uh, you know, if I, if I compressed it even more still. All right? Now, you can never recover from that poor uh, image, could you? No. That's exactly why you would do all your work based on the original. Because let's, let's say it wasn't quite this bad. Let's say it was passable. All right? And I used this image. And then I looked and I said, you know what? I, I want to do something else to it. You'd be better off going back again and starting again with, with that. Let's see some other things that we can do. Are we going to do any uh, raw editing? What do you mean raw? Oh, raw? with raw format? Yeah. Uh, probably not. We can change the, we can scale the image. All right. So right now, this is 1,000 by 768. We could make it smaller. Maybe make it 600. And it automatically calculates the height. 
Typically, when you see in almost any program where you see the little chain there, what that does is that links those two together, which is typically what you want to do because you want to change the height, you also want to change the width. The one thing that I absolutely cannot stand is if you edit one and not the other and end up getting an image that's stretched or, or skewed or whatever. The, when I see that on a website, that's like the, the, the red flag of amateurism. You know, I, you know, I, it, that is like, you know, instantly, you know, affects my opinion of the design of it. But you can go in and again size it. Remembering that when you go and size it, that if I wanted to go back and make it bigger later, I couldn't. So, for example, if I went under scale and I made this 300 pixels wide, and it automatically calculates the height and scales it. And I go, let's pretend I go and save it and then come back the next day and say, you know what? 300 was too small. I want to make it 400. Again, as you said, that information is gone. All right? So I couldn't go back and say expand it to 400. All right? That wouldn't work. I would be best off to, again, go back to the original, take the original and make it 400 as opposed to that. All right? I strongly encourage you to play with this. No one I know that has done a lot of photo editing has, has gotten there without just going in and saying, gee, I wonder what this does, and make some changes. There's all sorts of things you can do with the colors. You can affect the saturation. So again, I can make black and white if I turn the saturation all the way off, or I can make it maybe not black and white, but more of a faded color. Or I can sort of super saturate it where it looks vivid. All right. Now again, you could either do that for effect, or you could do that if you had an image that looked washed out or, or whatever. Um, there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do under color that relate to the brightness and contrast and so on for fixing it. The one thing that is an absolute blast to play with in the GIMP are these different... Um, different filters, like the artistic filter. We can go in and we can add a, where'd it go? We can add a cubism effect. Play with these. And it will go and it will transform it to simulate a cubist photo. Now again, I set the parameters big to be obvious, but you could do it more subtle for effect as well. Um, we'll talk more about layers next time. One thing you can do for neat effect is to have sort of two layers on top of each other where maybe one you put a treatment on. Um, are these useful most of the time? No, but they're a lot of fun to play with, and you can occasionally come across something that will work in a given situation. So it's good to be familiar with them. All right. One of the big things that we will talk about next time uh, in the GIMP is we'll explore some of these other features, but then we'll start talking about like layering images. Like what if we want to go, what if, for example, we wanted to make it so that the jellyfish remained in color, but the water was turned to black and white? How could we do that? We'll talk about ways that you can do that and different things that, that Questions? Yes? In the lab, you said you wanted a black and white of our, our picture that we chose? Yes. Did you want it like the true black and white, or did you want it in a grayscale where it's. Because black and white, it's literally black. No, no, no. Uh, like gray, grayscale, right. Okay. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't want it to be literally black and white. All right. Okay, we'll see you over in lab. Thank <clears throat> you.